altar, pray a little while, and go home and go to sleep. Those are really good songs. What a, what a blessing. Folks, you folks have been unbelievably kind, as always, and very gracious, and I uh, appreciate it. I hope that now that we've come to the conclusion of a week that uh, maybe you got a little something that you hadn't have. I realize you don't necessarily always get something out of every service, but sometimes all it takes is a little morsel to push you just a little further down the road. Sometimes you don't even know what you might have gotten until you wind up reaching in your bag one day and realizing there's four more stones in there besides just the one that you needed to kill Goliath. And uh, I really do appreciate the privilege of being here. I've done my best to try to point you to Jesus Christ. You're living in unprecedented times. The Bible says in 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy, he says it's perilous times. He said the times that you're living in right before the Lord comes back, they're like the days of Noah. We certainly see that going on now. And I think that in every other life uh, experience, every other thing that we do, we have the propensity or the tendency to set goals and objectives. I'm not sure why that when it comes to spiritual things, we just sort of freewheel it. You know, when it comes to being uh, autocratic at work, when it comes to being dictatorial at work, when it comes to taking a position to, to be in charge of things, we don't mind stepping up and taking control of that. But then when it comes to spiritual things, it's we read our Bible when or if we feel like it, and we pray. We do pray, but usually when we're in trouble, not really, you know, when things are going pretty well. And we, we do tend to come to church, well, unless we have a soccer match or a football game or, you know, a hot dog supper or, you know, it's like raining outside, which for y'all, nine months out of the year, like would be a reason not to ever come to church. I love this part of the country, but man, it's like already, it's like 7.30 or something, and it's like already like dark 30 outside, and it's almost like you can feel the cold is starting to, to that's why I'm flying south tomorrow. <laughs> Do you think peacocks can't fly? You watch tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll be flying and saying, hey, I'll, I'll see y'all, but I really do want to thank you for that. I want to try to give you something in closing tonight. Uh, in reference to setting goals and things like that, and not because I'm a motivational speaker at all, but I learned a long time ago, if you don't have anything to aim at, you're not going to hit anything. You have to have some kind of an idea of what it is that you want to do or accomplish. I realize that we're competitive, or most of us are competitive to a certain degree by nature. I'm not talking about being competitive and competing against one to another, but there should be some character things in your life that you make a decision about now so that when the temptation or the pressure comes, you've already made the decision. Uh, gentlemen, I would say this to you as much as I say it to the ladies and young folks. I would say it to you as much as I say it to the older or the elderly folks. You have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, it is much better to avoid than it is to try to resist. Yes, and you know, sometimes even with your physical system, your immune system gets down and suppressed. And sometimes something as simple as a cold will jump on you when any other time it wouldn't. But because you're tired, because you haven't been eating right, because you haven't been getting the right amount of rest, etc., it makes you more susceptible to disease. The same thing occurs in the spiritual life. If you don't pay attention to maintain not your salvation... You're safe with the Lord. You're standing with the Lord. It's just a complex way of saying, I'm seated with Him in heavenly places. My state, though, can change based upon current events that can occur. Uh, something happens in a bad way and I get my eyes off the Lord. Or as one lady said, she just got downright mad at the Lord because of a circumstance, a situation that took place. And uh, during the virus, the Lord, quote, uh, took someone that was very precious to her and then she recognized the Lord's hand in it. But sometimes that state can change. That doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It does mean you're out of fellowship. And if you're careful to maintain your fellowship with your spouse when it comes to being married, you should be equally as careful to maintain your fellowship with the Lord. If you mess up, fess up, get up. Don't wait around. But I wrote down just a couple of things that I don't want to do, and then I'm going to talk to you tonight about some things that I hope and pray that I don't miss. I'd like to say this, just five or six short things, a little blurbs. I don't want to leave the place where God put me because of taking or making a wrong decision like Adam and Eve. 
God didn't kick Adam and Eve out of the garden, as many people try to preach or say, uh, because he's just a mean God. God had warned them and warned them and warned them, and because they made a choice, they had to leave God's best. And God gave them a sacrifice, and we recognize that, but they were kicked out of the garden to never return again because of some decisions that they made. They should have made that decision before that time took place, but no matter who you are, the longer you stand and look at something that is forbidden, the more prone you are to fall for it. Don't keep standing there, don't keep looking, don't keep doing that. I don't want to get out just because I made a bad choice. I don't want to not be allowed to partake in things God wants me to be partake of th to things to take because I'm disobedient. Moses was told the first time to go speak to the rock and the water came forth out of the rock. You remember the story? And the next time he came up there and he said, I want you now that you struck the rock the first time, I want you to speak to the rock the second time. And because he got upset with the people. I mean, he's a pastor of probably a million people. And if you've been a pastor of 10 people, you can know that people can sometimes, if you've been to a family reunion, if you've been to a Thanksgiving dinner with family, you know pretty quick you can get frustrated with even with your family. And Moses got mad and he hit the rock twice, but because of his disobedience, it cost him a trip into the promised land and they had to be led in there by Joshua. Oh, well, but preacher, you know, he comes back during the tribulation and he's able to preach. He's one of the two prophets and we know that he's able to go into the promised land and then he gets his head cut off and then the Lord, after three days, glues his head back on and he's already showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't know any of that when God killed him. When he took him up into the mountain up there apart where he had received the law on two different occasions and had great fellowship with him the last time for 40 days he was up there and when God took him up there to kill him, he didn't say, Moses, by the way, I'm just going to put you to bed for a little while and then I'm going to take you out and i got great things planned for you. What he said was, is because you didn't do what I told you to do, there's consequences that are connected with it. I have no way to be able to tell you why it is that some get caught and some don't. I have no way to explain to you why when he says in Galatians 6, 7, though contextually it has to do with some things about taking care of the people that are taking care of you when it comes to scripturally and spiritually and teaching you the word, but he says you reap what you sow. I don't know why it is that sometimes people reap it sooner than other people. I can't speak for God when it comes to that, but I do know this. The Bible teaches be sure your sin will find you out. I'd better for it to be finding you out here than to find you out when you get up there. If you, even if you go to the judgment seat of Christ and you have to get up there and the Lord says to you, Hey, I want to talk to you about the works done in the body, whether they be good or bad. My sins are forgiven at Calvary. I don't have to worry about that. But if I don't have that thing fixed, I'm going to have to talk to the Lord about getting it fixed. You know what he's going to ask me? Why didn't you ask me to forgive you of that? Why didn't you quit it? And number three, I would like to say this, or four, whatever number we happen to be on, I wouldn't want to leave because of choices I make, the well-watered, uh, the, the fellowship with Jesus Christ for the well-watered plains out in a place called Sodom. Did you ever think about Lot when he's sitting there arguing with Abraham, and he looks over there and he said, boy, I can sure raise some fat cows over there, and boy, I can sure make my bottom line good, and man, I'm going to tell you what, I'll be rolling in high cotton, and I'll have plenty of money and over there, and I'm not going to go into the city. I'm just going to be close to him, and I'm just going to do business with him. I'm just going to be associated with him. I'm just going to be close to him, but, but it'll be good for cattle over there. Now, I'm fixing to make some of you uncomfortable, and hopefully I'll win you back before the service is over. He didn't tell him to go in there to destroy him. He didn't tell him to go in there to, to do anything unspeakable to him. You know what he said? He said, you shouldn't be around those people. Amen. What bothers me is, is that you're inundated with that now, and now you think all of a sudden I'm guilty of hate speech. I didn't say that they couldn't do what they want to do. I said it's better for you not to be around them. You say, why? The law of gravity. Surely you know that. You're living in a day and time where our churches have people that have chosen that lifestyle and they're in their families and you have to preach to people like that. And yet God's uh, period at the end of that sentence is, is Lot, you made a bad choice in life and you know what it did? You had some success for a while, but it cost you everything but your two daughters. Your wife turned around and turned to a pillar of salt and the rest of the people in there, your testimony was so messed up and so fouled up, they didn't even believe you when they said judgment was coming and an angel had to take you by the hand and drag you out of that city and I burn up that whole city and all them cows and all that the commerce you'd been and everything else you did. Why? Because you made a choice to choose monetary things over godly things. Amen. 
I chose a job over choosing I can be in church. I, preacher, I'd like to come to church. I'll be there on Sunday morning. I'd like to be there on Sunday night, but I, I, I can't come Sunday night because I've got to be ready for Monday because I've got to work. I've got a job. You know, I've got to provide. He that provideth not for his own is worse than an infidel, preacher, you know. Yeah, but what about the side of that where you're supposed to provide for him spiritually? Sometimes you have to recognize that there's some people you can have fellowship with and some people you can't. I better just leave that one alone. That didn't really get met with a whole lot of accolades. Uh, I don't want to be at home when I should be at war like David. Sometimes people say to me, you seem to be way too busy. How do you know it's not what God does to keep me out of trouble? People are so concerned about whether or not I'm getting enough rest and my travel schedule and what all I have going on. How do you know God's not using that to keep my mind occupied and my hands and feet occupied so that he's actually being a blessing to me because by the time I'm done with everything, I'm too wore out to get into any kind of trouble. How do you know where I would be? These girls were singing that first song, Mercy, he's been good to me, he's been good to you, you can tell by looking at me. Well, these girls were raised in a Christian home. They don't have a bad testimony. I mean, they might have done something, but nothing really, really bad. But you know what the truth of that song is? Is, is that you put your Bible down, you quit coming to church, you quit coming and doing what God would have you to do. That Bible teaches you that even though you're saved, you can be guilty of everything in Galatians chapter number 5 and do anything you could do before you got saved, just after you got saved, except go to hell. I don't want to be that individual. I don't want to be laying at the house and tired of the routine duty and worn out. And, well, I've won a lot of wars now and I've won a lot of battles now and I've killed a lot of giants now and I'm the big king. I'm just going to stay home and let somebody else go out. You know what else I want to do? I don't want to have God leave and take his hand off of me and me be like Samson and not even know it. I don't want to do that. You say, why are you telling me this? These are goals I set for myself. They're biblical illustrations that if we pay attention, that maybe if we would do that now, we might not find ourselves in a position. In other words, if I find myself going after the outlandish women, I find myself going after the outlandish things, I find myself doing what Lot did or what Moses did or what all these other illustrations, if I find myself in that position before it comes to my demise, how about if I back up and go, Lord, here I am, I'm back again, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, I want to get back and fail fellowship with you because I don't want to wind up that way. Those are some things that I hope and pray that I don't do. There's also some things I don't want to miss. Some things you can't help but miss. I hate missing a connecting flight. I hate when you get in, they're standing there by the baggage claim and then the little baggage thing stops turning and you recognize there's something unusual. Your bag is not on the thing. And so then you go into the thing and there and there and first the lady says, lost bag, huh? No kidding. Yes, ma'am, my bag is lost. Well, you know, give me your ticket. Say, oh, yeah, we found it. You know, it's on another flight. I, I don't really know. Well, how did it wind up on the flight going up to Michigan, and I live in Florida, and I'm not even in there. I just flew from out west. Well, we don't know, but these things happen on occasion, and thank you very much, and have a nice day. And I, oh, boy, I, I hate, I don't miss when those things happen, but I've had some events that have occurred in my life that I am really glad that I didn't miss. I don't want to miss, look in John chapter 20 if you're not already there. This will sound juvenile to some of you, but I don't want to miss church services. In the last days, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 10, if I recall it correctly, he said, Forsake not the assemblies yourselves together, even more so such as you see the day approaching. And then he says in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, he says, For the last days many give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and many shall depart from the faith. I know what happens is, is all of a sudden come into church, it doesn't have the luster it used to. Now what I'm beginning to hear people say about going to church is giving me all the reasons why they don't want to. Well, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and he he loves the church and he loves the people in the church and we make up the church and that and we should be excited about church but on the other side it's like giving me all the reasons why I can't go to church instead of all the reasons why I can go to church I want to keep church a priority I think the reason God called me to preach is because he said this if I don't call him to preach he probably won't study and if he doesn't study and I only give him a place to preach he probably won't even go to church y'all have a harder part than I do I have to show up. I was asked to preach. And so therefore, I'm, I'm not being funny. I'm being absolutely honest. I think the reason the Lord allowed me to be a policeman when I was only 19, had to finish all my college and all the other kind of stuff after that, I think the reason he allowed me to be a policeman at 19 was to keep me out of trouble. 
I don't think I was some great attribute to the, or, or, or success story to the communities in which I worked. Certainly not at 19 years of age. I think the Lord said, you know what, if I can make you a policeman, I can keep you from being a dope smoker or a drunk or whatever else it might be. I don't know what I might have been. I wasn't raised around that stuff, but I know myself well enough to know that if you give me a little bit of time in the wrong crowd, maybe one day I wind up getting started down the wrong path and my life story might be something entirely different. I think the Lord did me a favor when he called me to preach. I'm sorry you have to suffer because of it, but I, I don't really think that it's a, a big thing where the Lord's like, hey, you know, I'm so glad you came to church. It's like, that's what I'm supposed to do because that's my call to duty. And there's a story years and years ago about an old general that was in the south and when the war came to an end and Antietam took place and uh, he saw a lot of the cavalry horses having to be put to death and they were slashed up and they had some of them had one eye that had already been poked out. They had been shot up and, and all that, but they had been so faithful that it just broke his heart and so he gathered those horses together and bought a place down in the south and had a big pasture where he turned those horses out. And the illustration is told that that old general would come out and when the sky would begin to turn black and the thunder would begin to rumble and the lightning would dance out across the sky that all of a sudden the horses would come from different areas in those pastures and they would all gather together and as if somebody was trying to orchestrate them to get ready to go charge against the cannon fire they would line up and they would look right into that storm and he said those horses would have their heads up even though they were all battle worn and torn up and slashed up and beat up and as old as they were he said when all of a sudden that storm came up he said they lined up like they were getting and called into battle. I thought, man, I want to be like one of them horses. And the thunder starts rolling and the storm's coming and let's go do it one more time. Let's go stand up. You say, what? That's my call to do. That's my responsibility. That's not me, you know, well, hey, I just really can't wait to do it. It's what God said. This is what I want you to do. I don't want to miss services. I don't want to miss sermons. I, I like being in church. I'm churchy. Every great thing that has happened to me in my spiritual life, if, there's not a lot of them, but the ones that have happened, the defining moments, they've happened in a church service. I mean, I've been around some great church servers. Me and Brother Lynch, and they were singing Be Thou My Vision tonight. That was his favorite song. I was thinking about him. We were in the Philippines one time, and we were way up there in Baguio City. We had come through Papanga, we went Manila, and then, Manila and the Papanga and Tarlac, and then up through the winding road up there in second gear the whole time because the truck was stuck in second gear and drove me insane. <laughs> I thought you were going to blow this thing up, man. And then, you know, there's not like another gear. He gets ready to pass a truck on a road about that wide. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm telling you, the road's about that wide. The, the shoulder on the road's that wide. But you're thinking, that's a long way down there. Well, you know, you generally drop it down in another gear. He only had first gear to drop it down to. Well, that was way too low. So in second gear, it's already going, ee, and then he just stomps on it. And he goes, ee, and I'm like, we're going to die right here. Two preachers die and, you know, we're going up because he doesn't know how to get it out of second gear. And we go up there on that mountaintop and there's a little old small building up there made of all kind of different things, whatever they could find. And we find uh, some Filipinos there on the floor around a single candle in the middle of the floor. And they're all laying in a circle and they got their Bibles. They're all touching this way like this and they're all like that and their hands are like this and they're reading their Bible. And we walked in there, it was nice three, about 3 or 3.30 in the morning, and we walk in there, and they're in there, and they look up, and they go, they're here. And the next morning, we get there, and they're all waiting. They've been sleeping on like a mat. I mean, I'm talking like a bathtub mat, that kind of a mat, grass mat. They get a bowl of rice in that morning. They come there, and Brother Lentz would preach, and then I would preach, and Brother Lentz would preach, and then I would preach, man. And then we would get done, and we'd be soaking wet. There's no air conditioning. It's 100 degrees. It's hot. They say, you rest and preach more. <laughs> Jim said, you're first. I said, I'm, I'm dying. You can go first. And so we preach the whole afternoon. You rest, and we preach more. Well, in the afternoon in Baguio City, there would be clouds that would come in. And, and just every afternoon, those real heavy clouds would come in. No windows in the building or anything like that. It's up on the side of the mountain and stuff. And they would sit out there in a congregation. They had a little four-foot rise, not much higher than that, maybe, a, maybe even a little lower than that. That was the platform. It had a pulpit up there. And, and I was up there preaching. It was my turn to preach. And I started preaching about heaven. And I started preaching about riding the horses back. They're sitting in a little school desk, like little first and second graders. And they're sitting there. They're just enamored with what's going on in the service. And then all 
all of a sudden I talked about coming out of heaven and we're on the white horse and here comes the Lord and he's leading the way and one of them goes, yee-haw! <laughs> and he grabs the front of his desk and he starts like he's hitting the horse like this and he's hopping around in his desk like this and the next thing you know they're all starting to hop around look like a whole bunch of jumping beans in there and a guy jumps out of his desk he takes off running outside he runs down the hill he jumps in the horse trough down at the bottom of the hill he comes back up he's soaking wet I start talking about being in heaven and the Lord descending from heaven with a shout the voice of the archangel and coming in the clouds right and the Lord like turned on the fog machine those clouds moved in I mean, I'm like, now look, it's, it wasn't like supernatural and we didn't have a fog machine. It just happened. I happened to say that at the time when the clouds came in. But you talk about like so thick you couldn't like, he had needed to see an eye dog to get out of there. Man, it got good. It was like, he's here. <laughs> I wouldn't want to miss that service for anything in the world. I remember being in Mount Airy, North Carolina and I was struggling with leaving the sheriff's office and making retirement and how much longer I'd have to be there and what could I do if I made it and am I making a foolish decision or not making a foolish decision and I know I've already started the church, I've been pastoring it for 10 years and you know if I just wait a couple more years and plus the time I had and, and all that stuff and I'm talking to my wife and the old preacher he gets up and he draws a picture called the parting of the ways. You know it's the one where Oprah's there, not Oprah. And it's the one where Naomi comes in, remember, and she should have learned a lesson Amen. that she went down there, and then after she got down there, she lost her husband, and then she lost her two boys, and you know the whole story, right? It's kind of like the Lord's like, uh, hello, probably not a good place for you to be, but she stayed 10 years longer than she should have, and they get ready to come back, and her and Ruth get ready to come back, and you know what happens? Both of them kiss her. And one said, I'll go wherever you want to go and I'll do whatever you want to do and your God's going to be my God and your people are going to be my people and I'm going with you. And you know what the other one said? I'm going back to my gods, I'm going back to my people and I'm going back to... And man, it was like the Lord came in. He didn't physically. It's like the Lord came in and sat down next to me and he said, well, how about it? Are you ready to go? I'm like, well, uh, yes, sir. He goes, now. I'm thinking, well, Lord, what about the woman thou givest me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're security driven, and, you know, they're, you know, I mean, we're pretty high in the cotton here, Lord, and that kind of a thing. And I look over there to find her. She's not there. Man, I'm at the altar. I am squalling. I'm crying like a little girl, man. I'm down there and I'm sitting, okay, Lord, I surrender all. I'm throwing everything on the altar, man. I mean, I mean the whole nine yards. I'm like, Lord, you just, I'm ready to go. I mean, just that sweet fellowship in, in church, you know, and I get up. And here comes this girl. She's walking at me. She looked like she had been run over by a car like a raccoon. All of a sudden, she's like, I'm going, that's my wife. What happened to her? You know, now I know this is not going to fit well with some of you, but she actually wears makeup. You know why? Because I like it. She's blonde-headed, she's kind of fair-complected, she looks pretty without makeup. But I'm like, baby, it's okay, put some paint on the barn, no problem at all. <laughs> That's funny, relax. <laughs> That's so unspiritual. No, she, just, uh, she did it for me. And, but all of a sudden, this is back before the days where, like, you have that waterproof stuff or whatever. You know, unless you were using, like, you know, Johnson & Johnson Vaseline or something like that, I mean... <laughs> You put that stuff on, it was like painting your face with charcoal, and when you cried or sweated, it just, you know, it was just like all over you. Well, here she comes. She is blubbering. She is slinging snot everywhere, all 110 pounds, sopping wet with her, blonde-headed girl, and, and she's walking toward me like this, and I'm thinking, oh, she never looked prettier. It's like, oh, she was so, it's just, and I'm like, are you okay? She goes, I'm fine. Are you okay? I said, I'm fine. I said, you okay? And we're sitting down there, and we're thinking, and you know what the Lord was doing? The Lord was dealing with her, and the Lord was dealing with me, and he wasn't dealing with us together was dealing with us separate because we were in church. Some of the greatest sermons I've ever heard were in church. The times where God has dealt with me not missing services. You know in John chapter 20 where you are there, I'll just tell you the story. You remember one of the very first independent Baptists in the Bible. It wasn't John the Baptist. It was Thomas. You say, Thomas was a Baptist? Yeah, he's an independent Baptist. He's a King James only Baptist. You know how I know? He wasn't at church on Sunday night. 
<laughs> you know how I know? Because he knew that God wouldn't show up if he wasn't there. Because when they came to tell him, hey, God came by, he's like, ain't no way God came by. I won't believe that unless I see him myself. God didn't show up without me being there. You know what he did? He missed the presence of God. He missed God's person. He missed the, the peace that God said when the Lord showed up. He said, peace be unto you and all that. But here's the thing that he missed. He's looking for God's will. Now, a lot of people make fun of Thomas. But remember, in John chapter 11, when Lazarus is dying, he says to him, he said, Lord, let's go into the city. Let's go ahead and go. And the, they're trying to look for Lazarus. And they're trying. I mean, they're trying to look for Jesus in order to be able to kill him. And Thomas goes, well, let's go in there. And the Lord's like, wait a minute. They're trying to kill him. And he's like, I don't care. Let's be a suicide bomber. Let's go in there and die for the Lord. You know, and all the other apostles are like, Thomas, you, you need to chill out. You don't hear much about that side. But something happened between John 11 and where we are in the passage here in John 20. Because in John 20, he wasn't where he should have been. He wasn't in church. You know what happened? He winds up missing not just the power and the presence, but he misses God's plan for his life. Because he wasn't where he was supposed to be in church. Here's the odd thing. After they hear about the meeting and after they go tell Thomas about the meeting, you know what winds up happening? The Bible says eight days later, the Lord shows back up again. In the Jewish time, what they do is they count that day as one day. So eight days later would actually be on the calendar seven days. It would have been again the Sabbath day and the Lord waited until the day they were supposed to be in church to speak to Thomas because he's making a point. Thomas, if you'd have been where you were supposed to be when I came by, you wouldn't have missed the blessing. Here's the problem. God does not always come by in a church service. Our issue is, is we need to be here when or if he does come by. It's more likely that I will find God in a church service than I will in my Buick or in a bass boat. Or you know what? Back when I used to hunt a lot, this is a strange thing. I mean, I've seen a couple of deer killed on the highway before. But I don't go hang my tree stand on a light pole on 295 in Florida. <laughs> You're laughing. But you know what? I mean, I've even tried to think about it. You know, you get a new lure and that kind of thing. You got a fishing pole, you know, and you, you ain't going to catch many fish in the bathtub. Don't you usually go where the fish are? Well, that's a common sense, right? All right, so if I want ice cream, then I have to go to a certain place in the grocery store. I've got to go to an ice cream store to get it. I certainly don't go to a plumber and ask him to fix my car or an electrician and ask him to fix the plumbing, right? Why is it then when it comes to the coming to church, it is that we say, you know something? I go to church and the Lord, he just ain't there. Y'all don't say it that way. I go to church and the Lord hasn't showed up in quite some time. In the south, we just go, Lord, I ain't there. <laughs> yeah, but what if that one time you're not there, he comes by, and it's that life-changing opportunity? Right. What if it's that one time where God comes by with that special service? Just You ever been in a church service where the preacher's preaching, and you're kind of like, you're hitting your wife going, uh, have you been talking to him? <laughs> that ever happened to you? Yeah, you're thinking to yourself, hmm. <laughs> Couldn't help himself. It's kind of like, yeah, me. <laughs> he used to have a guy who was in the Navy. He was at station down in Jacksonville. He sat on the front row. His name was Joe Blasetti. He was a great guy. I mean, but he was really rather outspoken. And so I would be preaching, and I would go, and you know it isn't right to be cussing. He'd go, bullseye. <laughs> I, said, I said, what? He goes, you got me, bullseye. It ain't right to be cussing. I said, you don't have to tell everybody that. And then I'd go on a little bit longer and I'd say, and you ought not to be sucking on them suds either, you know, drinking that, drinking that beer or something like that. He'd get, bullseye! I'd say, Joe! <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, do you drink beer? I said, no, I know what beer is. How do you know what beer is? When I was young, we were out there, the bunch of horses were out, and I asked my dad, I was just happened to be in the pasture, I said, Dad, what's beer? He said, you see that horse relieving himself over there? You see that kind of yellow foamy stuff? I said, yes, sir. He goes, that's beer. A couple years later, I'm looping for him. I'm caddying for him. We're going through the chain. We're going through to get a hot dog or some pack of crackers or whatever we're going through there. And we walk into this place where, you know, all these fellows are sitting up there and they're kicked back and they're eating their sandwiches and drinking their coca Colas and stuff like that. And there's a guy there that has one of them mugs and he's got horse urine in it, you know. And I'm like, Dad, that guy's drinking horse uh, stuff. And he, man, he grabbed me. He's like, son, come with me, son. Come with me, you know. We go, 
we go running out the door. There, there are certain things like that that don't, that, that doesn't really trip my trigger. But I would get to preaching and he would get going back and forth. Back and, yeah, I've done, yeah me, I've done that before. But what a blessing the time that you're in the church service and that cloud moves in and God settles in and he settles your heart and gives you a peace that passes all understanding. What a blessing to be worshiping with other saints and have that friendship locked up together because you were there. Hey man, remember when we were there and they got to singing that song about heaven and remember how God came down and man, wasn't that good. You say, why does that matter? Man, those memories. Those memories are something you can grab a hold of when things aren't going good. Well, if God showed up back then, maybe He'll show up again. I like the songs. I like the old-fashioned songs. I don't like the contemporary stuff. I don't like the country-western stuff. You know, that country-western stuff, back home where I'm from, that's where everybody, all you have to do is have like a dog, a pickup truck, and a can of beer. you got a song. we got to throw a Bible in there somewhere, you know. You know, you know, is it on Sunday we went to church before we went to the bar, you know, and that kind of thing, and, and so on and so forth. And then if you play the record backwards, they get all their stuff back. <laughs> but, but, but when you take that music and you try to put biblical, scriptural words to it, 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 it don't feel right. It feels like I'm trying to bring the honky-tonk into the church house. You know, back home we have a lot of contemporary churches and they have this whacked out, crazy, like headbutt music. Like you listen to it and it's like, I want to kill somebody. <laughs> you, you just like want to walk up to somebody and just Ugh, headbang them in the name of Jesus, you know. I mean, I felt the spirit. It was, oh, yeah, man, I feel, I feel better now. But, but man, nothing better than the right songs. Nothing better than singing about my anchor holds. Amen. Nothing better than singing the songs that you heard. I don't, I don't want to miss those things. I don't want to miss church services. As it gets older, you know what I have to recognize? I have to make my mind up that it's part of what I'm going to do. I, I don't want to retire. Mama Utley, she's up in the mountains in North Carolina. She's in her 80s now, and she had to have a hip replacement because the pain got so bad, and she had a real, real hard time, very, very hard time. He's been up there now. I preached this 50th a couple years ago. 52 years pastoring the same church. That's a bit of an anomaly. He's got a great wife. We call her Mama Utley. She'll sit on the front row and her mouth will be moving. She'll be praying for you and stuff like that. And, and she had a real hard time and her hip was really giving her a fit. And I tried to talk to her, but she can't hear and, and that kind of thing. I was trying to explain to her and they wrote her some notes and, and stuff like that. And, and she was getting kind of depressed and down and she felt like she was just weighing the preacher down. And, and because she couldn't get up, she didn't think she was ever going to get up. The pain was excruciating. And so she was just, you know, praying. And if Mama Utley prays and says, Lord, come get me, it's kind of like the Lord's like, oh, okay. I, I mean, she's that kind of prayer warrior like she'll call like seven o'clock in the morning and go hey boy I'll say hey mama how are you doing fine are you all right uh, well yes ma'am I'm, I'm, I'm fine hmm that's funny strange the Lord woke me up four o'clock this morning and told me to go up on the mountain and pray for you I said well no ma'am we're doing fine you, you, you're sure you're all right oh no it's really bad oh, you know, it's that she's one of them she's like and she doesn't like you know almighty heavenly God we come before you she's like Lord how are you doing I listen I'd like to talk to you about someone I mean when she prayed I was at a meeting one time there's a whole bunch of people at the meeting I said mama pray for me you know she did she goes oh God be on this boy and help him and pray help him to fling it down Lord and help him to pray and I'm thinking and all these people are like looking like what in the world you don't ask her to pray she will pray right now then well mama Utley was not doing good and and so she was like praying lord take me home i'm in the way you know i don't want to hold everything back and so the nurse came in and you know used the psychology approach you know it's like oh well if you had your wishes where would you go and what would you do and what would you like to do if we could get you up and go anywhere you wanted to go do anything you wanted to do what would you want to do she said i want to go back to church and the nurse was like oh She's thinking, you know, I want to go to the Bavarian Alps and go skiing, you know, or I want to jump on a sailboat and go, I want to go back to church. They said she got so excited when they finally got her home in a wheelchair for a while and 
and they found out she was doing good enough and they drove her up to the door of the church and gently put her in the wheelchair and they rolled her down to the edge of the, uh, in the, in the church house and set her on the front pew where she always sits. And they said she was sitting here like this. Brother Reddish called me and said she sat down there and she just, and they got going, she said, that means I got to say something. I just want to thank the Lord that I could come back to church. I can't hear nothing and I can't hardly see anything, but I know I'm where I ought to be and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord. And she sat there the whole time while the preacher's preaching, just holding her Bible and sitting there because she just wanted to be back in church. I wonder how many times we take that for granted. I, I don't want to miss the songs. I don't want to miss the sermons. I, I like the scripture. I'm old school. I like them D's and thou's. Makes me feel like I'm smart or something. They're always trying to tell me we take out the these and thou's, and we all know that's a lie, and I know you're King James Bible believers. They take out the these and thou's because it makes it easier to read, and I'm saying, you call me stupid? <laughs> well, it means, you, it means I can't learn how to read these and thou's. So now I, I keep a King James wife because I'm smart enough to be able to understand these and thou's. I don't need somebody to change it for me so I can understand it, make it simpler, that kind of a thing. I, I, I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss the shout. Amen. I, I, look, I, I realize that if I die, I know where I'm going, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I, I understand that. I really would like to be here for the rapture, though. A lot of people have experienced death. There's only going to be a few experience the rapture. And if you've already died and you experience it, it's kind of like, you know, whatever. I was alive when we got raptured. <laughs> You realize how rare you'll be? You know, I was alive when we got raptured. I mean, you know, I was one of those that suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, I was changed and my bile body put on, uh, more, my mortal body put on immortality and, and all that other kind of stuff that's in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, right? And then in the twinkling of an eye, you know, suddenly I was changed. That's a good scripture, by the way, for nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's for the nursery. That's good. <laughs> I just thought about that. There's just a little nugget. You can put that over the nursery and you're good to go. But, but here's the thing. The Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the health of 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, the voice, the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That gives me pause because you know, I've buried a lot of people lately. I've buried a lot of my friends. Monroe was a friend of mine. 45 years we were together. As, I mean real friends. I ain't talking about Facebook electronic fake friends. I'm talking about friends that when you're mixing it up with people and you are up to your eyeballs and alligators, he's right there with you. And if you're going to die, he's going to die right there with that kind of friend. I mean the kind of friend you call 3 o'clock in the morning. He don't say, why are you calling me? He says, what do you need? That kind of friend. Amen. The kind of individual that has your back no matter what's going on or what's happening. The kind of individual you got a deer down at 7 o'clock at night. You can't find him. You pick up the phone. He takes off from work, shows up out there with a spotlight to help you blood trip. That kind of friend. 45 years. You say, where is he? This is the same guy that when I used to train with him, Monroe took me one day, grabbed a hold of me. We have an old saying back in the day, the statute of limitations is out now, so you don't have to, nothing you can do for me. If you can't breathe, you can't fight. So he kind of put his fingers gently around my esophagus and pinned me against the wall, lifted me up off the wall and pinned me up against the wall and said, I don't want to hear anything. You used a few expletives about your Jesus anymore. And then put me down. That's my friend, right? I mean, we we're like... Really close. I got the impression he really didn't want to hear about Jesus. Well, about 30 days later, he's in a parking lot on a midnight shift, and Jesus came and sat down next to him in the police car. Not literally, but he had to pull off and pull in the parking lot, and he called me in the middle of the night. All right, all right, I did it, okay? I said, you did what? You killed somebody? Where are they at? I'll help you bury the body. I mean, he was so vehement. I'm like, I did it, I did it. I'm like, okay, don't tell anybody that. Get an attorney, it's okay. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say, can it will be used against the court of law. You have a right, you know, that's why. And he's like, no, I asked Jesus to save me. I'm like, wow. Um, mm, uh, mm. I called his wife. I said, she goes, I already heard, I'm awake. <laughs> and put him in a box in February. Full-blown police honors. People that were there back when we first started. Sheriffs from other counties. 
Man, taking that flag draped coffin out that door out there and taking my friend out there and that rain was coming down, drizzling and that fire team was over there, man, and they come to attention and they're standing there and that rain is dripping off the edge of that hat and pouring off the end of their nose and they're standing there and they go through the orders and they've got their guns here and we get ready, we get the coffin there, we get ready to do everything and then they get called to order and they step up and clack, 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 clack. And you hear the ready aim, and that sounds like one going gun off, and there's seven of them that go off, and they go off three times. And they eject those shells, and those shells, that brass dances out across those cemetery tombstones out there on that cold, cool, pouring down rain day, and all those individuals standing out there out of respect for him in that driving rainstorm, and they come to attention there drop it back down and stand there at parade rest like that. Man, whew. I'm thinking, boy, I sure am glad he's saved. I remember when my daddy died. I, my dad and I were really close. And when my dad died, it was on a Wednesday night, but be, before he died, we had had some conversation and stuff like that. I, I remember him looking off like he was looking off in the distance, and he said, boy, that's pretty out there. He, had glaucoma real bad, and he was looking and squinting. And I said, what's that? He goes, you see that up there? I lied. I said, yeah, Daddy, that's really something. I don't know what in the world. He said, that's the most beautiful house I've ever seen in my life. Man, that's beautiful. Man, whew, I'd like to live there. About five minutes goes by, and I said, hey, Daddy, you know about that house? And he said, what house? See, I think he's kind of slipping in and out, slipping over to the other side and back. You believe whatever you want to believe. I don't care. After a while, I look over there, and he's doing this. To my knowledge, he never sewed a thing a day in his life. You say, what was he doing? I don't know. Maybe he's making a garment in Psalm 45. I don't know. Psalm 145. I don't know. I, don't, I couldn't tell you. Looks like he's getting ready for something. Looks like he's kind of in transition. I remember on that Wednesday night about 9 o'clock, man, I remember that. I've heard it so many times, man. And that long last breath comes out and that little bit of a rattle and that phlegm at the very end of everything. And then he passes from this life to the next. And the nurse comes in because the machine's going off and stuff like that. And I'm standing there and I'm like this. Crying like a little girl. Tears running down my cheeks, man, dropping off my chin. It's not coming out of my nose. And I'm wiping it like this. And she said, uh, are, are, are you okay? I said, I was just waving at my, my daddy. She goes, oh. I said, oh, I really think he could probably see me. I'm not sure there wasn't somebody with him to take him up. You say, why? I believe the Lord came to get him. Amen. I believe the Lord came to get Monroe. I remember when Jim passed. And down there with him, your daddy knows him, knew him. And down there with him, and he and I had an unusually close relationship. And he used to tell the story about Billy and Johnny. Remember the illustration about Billy and Johnny? Billy and Johnny were really close friends, and Johnny got run over by a a car and they took him down to the hospital and mama wouldn't let Billy go down to the hospital and the church is praying because Johnny's going to die and Billy sneaks out of the window and he shouldn't have, jumped on his bicycle he went riding down to the hospital, he snuck past all the people in the waiting room and goes into that room over there and the doctors had already come in there and they said look we're going to leave it for an hour before we tell them they're going to turn off the the respirator and there's that old fluorescent light in there and it's really cold in there and he looks up in that thing he looks in the window and he sees his friend in there and he sneaks in there and he reaches up there and he grabs Johnny's hand he said Johnny this is your best friend Billy I need for you to breathe a little bit of time goes by he said Johnny this is your best friend Billy I need for you to breathe and after a little while he felt a shadow come over the top of him and he said, uh, he turned around and looked, and the doctor says, well, what are you doing? He said, uh, my name's Billy. This is my best friend, Johnny, and I'm just telling him he needs to breathe. And that doctor put his hand on the shoulder. He said, young man, he said, God must have heard your prayer. He said, because he's breathing over the respirator now, and instead of disconnecting him and letting him go, it, it looks like he's going to survive. Well, that was one of my favorite stories to hear Jim tell. So he was getting kind of close to the end and kind of in and out. He'd wake up sometimes. It was kind of strange. He'd wake up sometimes, and I'd be sitting right across from him, and he'd open one eye. I don't know why. I just wanted to just like watch him pray, I guess. I don't know, but he'd, he'd go like this. I said, I'm still here. Yeah, I see that. How long I've been asleep? I said, In about three days. He goes, you're an idiot. 
I said, why do you say many? He said, you're wearing the same clothes. I said, I've already gone home and changed and showered several times, had my clothes washed and brought back. He said, you're an idiot. <laughs> We'd talk at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, just me and him about all kind of things. And he got close to the end one time, and I got over there next to his bed. He was asleep, and I took his hand. You're supposed to give me a hand. <laughs> I'll mess up my illustration. And I'm holding on to his hand, and I'm praying. I'm praying, you know, you got to breathe. I didn't want to say goodbye to him. I knew he was going to die. And he woke up, and he looked down inside the bed. He said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, you're Johnny, and I'm Billy, and I need you to breathe. He said, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I remember when he was absent from the body. I'm present with the Lord. I watched him leave this life and head for a greater life here out. When he said, the dead in Christ shall rise first, I got to thinking to myself, suppose I'm in a church service one day and the back door opens and the old preacher comes in. He's been gone five years now. Hey, brother, how you doing? Good to see you. Amen. You know. <laughs> some of you get it, some of you won't. <laughs> Behind him, here comes my dad. Hey, bud. How you doing? Kind of looking around the corner, there's old Jim. And there's your family member. And there's the dead child that's been resurrected to newness of life. And there's the grandma and the grandpa. And there's the, the wife or the husband. And there's the loved one. And all of a sudden they're there. And you know what they're going to do? I'm going to have to cut this out because we're going way too long. You know what they're going to do? They're not going to come up in like a family reunion and say, How have you been? You know what they're going to say? Man, wait till you see Amen. where we're going. <laughs> and about that time, you'll feel something strange, I believe, because there's a change that transpires. The Bible says that we'll all be changed suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, and all of a sudden, the stuff that are hurting don't hurt anymore. My back doesn't ache. My knees don't hurt. My eyesight's perfect. I don't need glasses and false teeth are hitting the floor and everything is like that and all those extra pounds get shed immediately. It's a perfect yeah. diet program. And then all of a sudden the Lord says those great words come up hither. And you start up through the sky. And you're looking down on this little marble of an earth and you're thinking to myself, goodbye, good riddance, man. Your eyes are turned toward him and the birds are waving goodbye to you and wish we should go with you and that kind of thing. And your loved ones are saying, man, why do you meet him? Man, why do you meet him? Man, why do you meet him? It's going to be unbelievable. And you get up there and there's these huge pearly gates. You can just touch them and they swing open. The most beautiful walls of jasper you've ever seen encrusted with jewels made by a master jeweler and sinful hands have never touched them and sinful eyes have never seen them. The Lord steps into that place and has done some paving work, some excavation work. He's excavated all of the roads there and paved them all with pure gold. So pure, that gold, that it is transparent. It's like glass. It's so pure. He takes the baton out and the greatest composer ever to put notes on a piece of paper brings to attention the angels and the choir of cherubim and seraphim. And I imagine in my mind's eye in the string section, there's David over there. He'll be playing the harp. He has a solo in my piece here. You see, but isn't he a king? Yeah, but if you get the privilege of playing for the king or being the king, trust me, it's worth it to play for the king. I mean, his music was so good it drove off demons. He must be a good harpist. Isn't that, isn't that strange to you? David plays a harp, and he's one of the greatest soldiers in the Bible. I mean, he like kills people with rocks. Right? He's like a bad dude. <laughs> That's a mind blower. And, and the choir begins to sing and the wind instruments and the trumpets begin to play and all that. And about this time, a guy whose back used to be sort of humped over and bent over, he's now straightened up and he walks in and your loved one says, hey, this is Apostle Paul. Did you want to meet the Apostle Paul? And Paul will say, hey, just... Hey, nice to meet you. We'll talk to you later. We're waiting right now for a grand entrance. 
And all this is being done for the bride of Christ. And then about that time, in walks the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And seats himself like a diamond in the center of a king's crown and sits down and the entire heaven grows silent, waiting, hanging like Mary's at his feet, waiting for him to just speak. And all your trouble, and all your problems, and all the strife, and all those things that are plaguing you so much in this physical world, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the master takes him away. I don't want to miss the Savior. I know we have the seat. I know we have the second coming. I'll have to save that if, if he ever has me to come back again in the next five years. I'll tell you that one. But if you could focus tonight as we wrap things up on not just where we're going, but who's going to be there. Not just your loved ones. Not just the saved individuals. Not just all the benefits we get, but not the path, but the person. Your Savior is going to be there. The one that bought you, paid for you, never gave up on you. I don't know if you've ever messed up after you've been saved. And I don't know if you've ever had to apply the blood and ask the Lord to forgive you and, and recognize time after time after time that well of forgiveness is still there. The blood never runs out. And you're ashamed and you're embarrassed and you come back again and it's like, Lord, I, I need another I need another bath. I got dirty again. And he goes over into his closet up in heaven and he goes, Peacock, there's his robe. And there's the ring that he pawned. And there's the shoes to cover up his nasty feet again. Go ahead and kill the fatted calf. He looks pretty hungry. And let's make Mary his home. But in that time, you never have to worry about ever leaving again. We live in a day and time where it's possible because of all that's going on that you might have to say goodbye to somebody before the rapture. It's hard when all you can do is communicate with them through that face thing or whatever. It's, it's terrible. Monroe's dying. We're talking at first. He's talking back. The doctor, I talked to the doctor and everybody, the nurse and them, they would all go out of the room. And then Michael would talk. And then he was on a respirator. And he was on paralytics. And he couldn't hear a bomb go off. And they'd set it up and turn it. And I'd just talk. Hey, buddy, I hate it for you. We had always had an agreement, and, you know, we called it kick the plug out of the wall, and we always had an agreement. And I said, buddy, I can't, I can't get to you. I'm, I'm sorry I'm praying for you. And we'd talk, and then I'd turn it off. And every now and then get up in the middle of the night and just turn it on and just look at him laying there. He was there when we pulled all of the, the stuff out, and I got him fixed up before the family came in and, the possibility that you may not be able to be there when your loved one goes home. But there's somebody there if they're saved. There's an old grandma, she's 80-something years old, I don't remember exactly. I remember when I came in and found her in the house, she had obviously passed during the night and some of the individuals were there say, oh, it's terrible, she died alone and I looked over, over next to her bed, and there's a well-worn Bible right there. I looked around, and I saw some things. I began to talk to the little bit of family that was there as we began to gather. And, and after listening to the testimony of that lady, I told those guys, I said, she wasn't by herself. They said, no, no, there wasn't anybody in the house. And I said, no. The Lord was here with her. Amen. There's a little girl dying. I'm done with this. You've probably heard the illustration, but it's told as a true story that in the hospital she's dying of leukemia. She's scared as she would be. Cold in there to keep the bacteria down. Stinking fluorescent lights buzzing. Rubber shoes squeaking. The doctors and the nurses coming in there. and 
and that kind of a deal. They brought in a couple of rocking chairs there, and the mom and dad are sitting there next to the baby there, or sitting next to the child there, and the rocking there next to the bed. And this little girl's 12 years age. That's what the illustration is told. And she looks at her daddy and said, Daddy, I'm really, really scared, and can you please go with me? And daddy, as gentle as he possibly could, uh, you know, he, he can't lie to her, so he says, uh, Honey, I... If there was any way that I could go for you, or if I could go with you, I, I can't, but this is, and the little girl got really mad. I mean, she was not just, it's like, Daddy, you've always been there, and now I need you to be with me, and you're like, you know, you're, 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 you're leaving me on my own. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm scared. I, I don't know, and the story is told she turned her back to them and faced the wall, and she was just sobbing. Mom and Dad's hearts were just broken, and they're holding hands together, and they're watching that child as that child passes at any moment. And the story is told after about 30 minutes, the little girl turned back around and she was no longer crying. And her daddy said, honey, I'm so sorry I can't go with you. I, we love you more than life itself and we're so sorry. And tried as best he possibly could. And she stopped in mid-sentence and she said, daddy, it's okay. Jesus said he would take me over on the other side. He'll go with me where you can't go. So preacher, what, do you, what is that? Life before I see you again might end that way for you. But if you're saved, even if your family can't get to you because of all of the restrictions... You trust me when I tell you when you're in that area of departing, somebody steps in that area right there and says, how you doing? Amen. And there'll be a peace that passes all understanding wash over you. And you'll step from this life into that life right there with the greatest escort you could ever possibly have. I hope we stay around for the shout. But there's a possibility that those that we really love may go on ahead of us. So why do we have meetings like this? Just to remind you, life is not here. Life is in the hereafter. Amen. And every now and then we just have to unplug from the world and go, Okay, I just kind of needed to get recentered. I just kind of needed to remember where my priorities are. I needed to recognize that I don't need to be all consumed with all this. I need to be thinking about, hey, when I get up there, I want to be able to give him a little something after the judgment seat of Christ and just reposition my priorities. And that way, if the tragedy happens, you've already prepared for that time. If time marches on, some of us that are getting old now, we're going in a box or a jar, an urn. Now, because things are so backed up and stuff, people are having to do things we never thought we would see them do. But it's just a teapot. I'll leave you with this. My dad's favorite poem had me say it at his funeral over his grave. Here lies old man Pease underneath the shade trees. But peas ain't here, ain't nothing but the pod. Cause peas has shelled out and gone to God. There is a peace that passes all understanding. You say, why? Don't want to miss the services. Don't want to miss the scripture. Don't want to miss the song. Don't want to miss the sermons. Don't want to miss the Savior. And I want to be with the saints up in glory. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Your pastor comes, close the service any way that he wants to. Could I maybe just encourage you to do this? Maybe tonight you might want to consider, you know something, Lord? I think I'm just going to...